Fabulous. I hope We hope this series of events will provide a space for us to collectively sidestep our present AI FOMO, have an extended discussion of the political economy and data practices that inform AI imaginaries, finding their home both inside and outside the art museum. And in introducing today's event, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from stolen Aboriginal land, the unceded land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, one of the richest and oldest continuing cultures in the world. And in delivering this opening acknowledgement, I'm painfully aware that it remains in the realm of symbolic recognition, a speech act impotently delivered in the wake of a failed national re referendum that at its essence, promised to secure recognition of First Nations peoples in the Australian constitution in the form of a voice to parliament. This public program comes at a point where we are still coming to terms with the outcome of the referendum in Australia and what this might mean for reconciliation and the quest for self-determination and substantive rights for First Nations peoples. Next week, we will have the opportunity to discuss AI in the context of Indigenous data sovereignty and the future of the commons. And I'm grateful to First Nations colleagues who will contribute their time and knowledge over this period. Next week, we will be focused, uh, the week after, we will be focused on the limits of curatorial praxis and the modelling of the digital by institutions. Whilst our final panel, Bodies, Data, Model, Publics, in the third week of November, will address the socio-technical politics of data, tracking and analytics, both inside and outside the Art Museum. And of course, these panels are bookended by keynotes from artists Hito Stahl, who is the reason we're all here today, and James Bridal on the 30th of November. Before I hand over to Hito, a few housekeeping notes. You will notice that we're not running this in streaming mode, which means we can all enjoy each other's collective presence. However, this means we have muted all your mics to avoid sensory overload. We are recording this event if you'd like to remain anonymous, please change your name and keep your camera off. Hito will be talking for around 40 minutes or so, at which point we will have time for questions. We have activated the Q&A module to manage this, so please help us by submitting your questions there. It will be active during her talk. When it comes to Q&A time, you will have the opportunity to unmute and ask Hito your question. Please let us know if you'd prefer us to ask her on your behalf. So, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Hito Stahl, who needs little introduction. She's a filmmaker, artist, and writer, who's a leading thinker and practitioner working uh, on media technology and image circulation. Many of you will have read her recent essay, Mean Images, in New Left Review, where she ad addresses the statistical renderings of contemporary AI and the political economy of image synthesis. And I'd really like to thank Hito for joining us on this early Berlin morning and would now like to invite her to take over our screens. Thank you, Hito. Thank you so much, Katrina, for this most generous introduction and for having me. Uh, thanks for everyone for bearing with me this morning. I'm in a bit of an improvised situation, thinking in a sort of camping ground with a huge storm outside so i might get a little sidetracked now and then and also i would like to just describe the state of my talk from the beginning because everything is moving so fast uh, not only in the field but also in the world it will be a jumble of things which are at the same time outdated and not yet finished <laughs> so basically i'm inhabiting this temporality of you know uh, insane things that are at least a year old in some cases but also some things which i haven't really managed to properly think through so please consider this a kind of attempt or a work in progress or something which i invite everyone to in a way uh, add their thoughts and remarks to by no means is this uh, in any way uh, an authoritative account of uh, things that are happening in the field of machine learning right now. It's rather an incomplete attempt to try to digest all these things as they come. Um, the 
talk is called subprime images, and I will get to this point in a minute. Um, also discussing this in the context of a term that Jonathan Bella coined, which he named derivative images. But before doing this, let me briefly start with you know the beginning of my investigation already more than a year ago when um, basically in image machine learning based image generators, as you can see, <laughs> I prefer to navigate around the word artificial intelligence and try to not use it. Um, when generators like Dal E and the journey and all those other generators like stable diffusion um, entered the scene. And I started off with a very, very simple experiment using a very useful tool that uh, my colleagues, Matt Dryhurst and Holly Herndon developed, which is called Have I Been Trained? And it's basically a, a search engine for a database called Lion5B, which is a repository of around 5 billion looted text image pairs used to train a generator model called Stable Diffusion. And most of what I'm going to say is relating to Stable Diffusion because it's one of the only generators um, which open sources its code so you can at least have a look at what's going on. And I just wanted to see which pictures of mine show up inside the training data. It was basically a lot of text, but also some stills from my films. But if I ran <laughs> the model to render an image of myself, which prompted being just image of Peter Stein, it gave me this, <laughs> which I thought was pretty uh demeaning or mm, let's say surprising and um, not i couldn't really recommend this before after treatment to anyone before ai filter after ai filter this is what it looks like so the i i started to call these renderings because they are not photographs they are maybe images but they are rather renderings st statistic renderings i started to call them mean image to refer to the fact that obviously they they rely on a sort of averaging of stolen data also on a history of statistics which very often uh, crosses the line over into the field of eugenics, um, biopolitics, population regulation, um, defining norms for accept acceptable human beings, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, what mean are we talking about? Whose mean are we talking about? Which mean are we talking about? And I think the... Um, the, the generator or the model in this case, stable diffusion model, basically extracts the social signal from this whole repository of images, which is this one. But uh, I immediately also made a sort of counter rendering <laughs> inside my own internal model of what stable diffusion looks like. And this is what I came up with. This is my revenge rendering. It's the only true representation of what stable diffusion really looks like. So what does the term mean mean? As you see, it's connected to meaning as signification, but also to average, to the median, to lowliness, to nastiness, but also to instrumentality, the means as an instrument, and also the means in financial or instrumental terms. I will come to that, back to that um, later. And this means that they are always social averages. They are sort of structural mediocrity generated through chaotic sampling and large-scale kidnapping of data. And of course, they rely on massive underlying um, infrastructures of polluting hardwares, very energy intensive, also water-hungry infrastructures, which usually be belong to this or that uh, quasi-monopoly and use a lot of disenfranchised labor. I will come back uh, to that also later, which exploits political conflict 
as a resource to create cheap labor. Okay, one short dip into the history of meme images. This is um, the people's choice. It's a painting which was made by, um, uh, sorry, just a second, come back to this, by two artists called Komar and Melamid in 1993 to do it. They asked 1,001 Americans following questions, do you like smooth canvases or sick brush strokes? Would you rather look at a painting with nude figures or some that are fully closed? Should it be indoors or outdoors? What kind of landscape, et cetera, et cetera. And they amalgamated all the responses and had the result painted. And I think that one can fairly say that this already um, anticipates some kind of Dao-E um, composite aesthetics. Um, so they also did the least wanted painting and they specified it to certain countries. So it was a very interesting statistical aesthetic project before image generators even came into beings. Uh, today's prompt generators work in a similar way when it comes to, let's say, aesthetic populism, but they also integrate other components. And this is where I start to talk about subprime imagery and subprime aesthetics. A very brief explainer of how these bit image and video generators work. They work through so-called diffusion processes, which means that they first add and they they drown the available day training data in noise in a so-called forward diffusion process. If you look at this here, this face is sudden is getting submerged in noise. And this process is basically learned and then reversed by the model. The noise is removed. This is the reverse diffusion process. And then you can apply this to random noise samples. This sounds a bit confusing and technical, but to, to make myself understand how it works, I always go back to a metaphor that Michel Foucault used, used at the end of his book, The Order of Things. He describes similar imaging process um, when he, when he says that on the step from one knowledge paradigm to another, he, uh, a, a, a face of a human that is drawn in the sand could end up being washed away by the waves into the ocean and erased. Just to repeat, on the, on the step, from one knowledge of paradigm to the other, a face drawn in the sand on a beach of a human will get washed away by the waves and the rays. Now the reverse diffusion process is you, if you exactly reverse this, there is an empty beach with sand and then waves arrive backward and draw a face of a person into the sand. And this face will be a mean image, an averaged populist, basically statistical rendering. Um, yeah, so basically what many people say at this point, and I agree, even though that it's not enough, is that, you know, the training data be adjusted to be more fair and less biased, as so as to improve the renderings and make them less, you know, uh, impregnated by social bias, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think that you know, structurally, there is something quite different happening underneath in the mathematical and statistical base. Um, they don't just exclude and things because of bias. Instead, something more complicated is happening. They are making the exclusion process productive. 
that it's basically the exclusion projected forward. It's not that people are not represented at all. They are basically excluded forward in the sense of, you know, having a biased and mean imagery of them projected forward. And to further take a peek into how those diffusion models work, um, it's also worth taking a look at the mathematical frameworks underlying them, one of which is a so-called SDE. It's getting a bit technical here. It will get less technical in a while. The SDE is a stochastic differential equation. And this is one of the underlying frameworks. Now, it's interesting to look at the most famous SDE in history, which is the so-called Black Scholes equation decorated with a Nobel Prize. This is an equation, an SDE, just the same as those embedded in many, many image generators that promised to calculate future option prices, including the best timing to buy stock options. Now, this formula was extremely useful for traders. It was extremely popular. As I say, said, its inventors were awarded a Nobel Prize because the promise of being able to predict future price spawned a huge industry of derivatives within just a few years. The derivatives market exploded and we all know what happens next. Um, <laughs> it's the 2008 crash when all this market of predicted price-based derivatives completely crashes. Um, this formula was not able to predict or to give a realistic estimate for price pricing. Instead, it was a kind of, uh, well, let's say financial magic that happened, um, whereby people reassured themselves that there was a mathematical base for their wishful thinking about prices. Now, what does this mean in relation to image generators? It means that if such mathematical formulas are integrated into image generators, it's like literally putting a derivative market into an image generator that not only predicts what you would like to see, but what you should like to invest your attention into. It's some kind of attention investment advisor, structurally, because of the inbuilt uh, mass. Diffusion models predict likely Im imagery, just as these financial price prediction mechanisms predict the most likely price of futures. And this means that images become sort of bets or wagers, or rather bets on bets since they are derivatives. And this is why I call ML gen generated imagery, um, that why I say that they belong to something which could be called subprime visibility, because in a way they resemble this subprime debt financial products in which debt is reorganized in speculative ways. Um, Jonathan Bella once spoke rather intuitively of der derivative images, and he was hinting at a financial logic without really specifying which one. Um, in diffusion models, image generation is to some degree sharing basic functions with derivative finance and using them as a mode of production, basically. Um, another aspect of financialization, now the technical part is old. <laughs> um, yeah, another aspect of financialization of um, basically uh, ML-based image production. Uh, as I said, diffusion models need to be trained on large amounts of data, like Lion 5B, the 5 billion image, pair, image text um, pair database. 
And of course, all these image text pairs were randomly scraped and looted from the web in large scale expropriation sprees. This is one particularly callous example, uh, which also overlaps or not only overlaps, but is part of the crypto financial industry. What's going on in this image? You see there is this shiny orb and a lot of people maybe waiting the turn to look at the orb. But what happens is that this is a scanning session for so-called world coin. Uh, since December 2021, people in many parts of the world were faced with a surprising offer to exchange their iris being scanned against some hitherto unknown crypto asset called WorldCoin. And this is the gadget used to scan people's iris. And most of these scanning sessions happened in uh, countries like Sudan, Kenya, Indonesia, and so on in the first phase. And this project is a brainchild of Sam Altman of OpenAI, who described it as an experiment in providing some kind of global universal basic income. But researchers of the um, MIT Technology Review very quickly pointed out um, that world coins have very little discernible value. The ones it has has dropped by 50% since it launched. They are only exchangeable through an extremely cumbersome and hackable interface. Um, also, the of course, power disparities or inequalities because between the people who provided the iris scan data and the ones who collected it was enormous. Uh, the procedures to collect it were partly fraudulent and so on and so on. This operation was described by the CEO of WorldCoin as the biggest onboarding into crypto and Web3 to the state, and they expected to draft half a billion people into this platform. But as it turned out, um, the re reason for collecting all these iris scans was less to provide a proof of personhood, as the founders uh, claimed proof of personhood, meaning that every individual would be identifiable uh, through this data, but that it was much more likely that all this data would be used to train neural networks, so so called well, machine learning models on this data, which means that something that looked on the first surface or was declared on the surface to be an onboarding tool into specific crypto economies was in fact a large scale data collection operation to train machine learning models. So, and this is also how I describe basically all these freebie image renderings like the ones produced by Dali and so on. They are basically onboarding tools, not into a crypto economy, but into a slightly different machine learning tool economy, which I will describe a little later. But this is, of course, not the only part of, or not, not the only aspect of something which I would like to call the political economy of um, data uh, supply chains and also data preparation for neural networks. The case of ghost workers has been described very frequently in recent months. Um, ghost work, so-called ghost workers or micro workers are people who are tasked to basically clean, annotate, tag, filter, prepare data to be of any use in uh, training machine learning models. And many of these tasks are not only vastly underpaid, taking advantage of global inequalities, of course, but also in many cases quite traumatic. Um, we um, investigated about, I don't know, four or five months ago, cases of micro workers uh, inside Germany, um, where basically migrant and refugee um, legislation is taken advantage of to recruit 
people who are vulnerable in terms of, you know, um, laws to keep away migrants from the labor market and also refugees. So this is an interview um, one in our team did with a content moderator from Brazil who basically had a sort of many depressive episodes after being uh, asked to review a lot of very violent content online. And um, he was basically forced to do this because his qualifications from Brazil were not accepted in Germany. And he had to basically take on this kind of very vulnerable and unprotected and also not well paid um, occupation. There is another one which um, is also quite telling. Um, another interview with a digital worker from uh, the Syrian refugee contingent in Germany um, doing this kind of labor, describing, sorry, this not yet um, translated, describing how her colleagues, especially after the big earthquake in Turkey and Syria, part, partly had to filter out material relating to their own destroyed hometowns while you know being exposed to seeing this on a screen. Um, yeah, so just a second. Yes, so all these examples make clear that training not only affects machines or more precisely neural networks or models, machine learning models, it's equally people that are being trained not only as microworkers, but also as users in general. They are being trained basically to um, use this kind of technology to normalize it, to you know spread um, machine learning based generated image renderings, uh, basically to normalize this technology and to basically onboard, so to speak. So this is what training amounts to that whole populations are being trained to accept this kind of technology without honestly a clear use case in my point of view. Um, so what happens to summarize very quickly the process, the original rooted data are processed, they are ground to shreds and pieces in this process, getting rid of cop copyright attribution, prior ownership of data, but also any trace of the manual labor performed by the annotators, the ghost workers, content moderators. This data is then treated like debt in derivative financial processing. It is repackaged, divorced of its origin, and redefined as an asset. Derivative images, indeed. So here's a short um, side side comment on, on uh, basically model collapse, because I was asking myself, you know, if a formula like Black-Scholes, which is the formula to predict the future prices of options, if this led to a complete breakdown of financial markets, what kind of breakdown can we then expect, you know, from these new um, generate these new formulas which are embedded into image generators. It's maybe not a financial breakdown, but what kind of breakdown? It's certainly a breakdown of meaning. It's number one, a breakdown of trust, which I think is extremely critical. Um, if there is a complete breakdown of trust into any sort of evidence, that's already a huge problem. Problem number two is basically the issue of model collapse, because what happens is that increasingly models are being trained on their own output, meaning that people generate data, which is fed into AIs, and then the AIs generate more data, which is then fed into AIs, et cetera, et cetera. So this feedback loop has been described um, as leading to model collapse, which is of course also accelerated 
probably by the fact that many ghost workers by now have discovered that chat, chat GPT is their best friend. So basically, they submit work which has been generated by AI, leading to some kind of mm, reduction of probability space within the models. And this leads um, to basically models starting to forget anything that's slightly unlikely. And the result is that the output resembles some kind of machine dementia, you know, uh, over while they start to stammer and um, repeat stuff in the very narrow range of very likely predictions, which start sounding very, very um, weird to human beings. And someone has described it, a blogger, uh, writing in the context of model collapse, as a JPEG image recompressed too many times. The internet of the AI-driven future is destined to turn into a giant pile of worthless digital wild, white noise. And another blogger describes it as, just as we've strewn the oceans with plastic trash and filled the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, so we are about to fill the internet with blah. Okay, and this is very interesting because for me, this points at a very important threshold. Remember all these data um, that are looted from the web that are used as training materials, et cetera, et cetera, start being described in terms of fuel, almost like uh, oil consists of the carcasses of decomposed shellfish. All this you know, data could be seen as the spent leftovers of images and other data that are nevertheless fed back into the system for another round of secondary derivative extraction, but still spending real energy, guzzling up water, creating carbon emission and augmenting entropy elsewhere in the system. And this sort of shift towards seeing oil as really uh, uh, data as some sort of tangible source as energy points to me to a shift whereby image generation seems to leave the realm of optics and enters the realm of thermodynamics of information, entropy, heat, energy, heated climate, non-linear weather effects. And of course, to, you know, basically uh, information scientists, et cetera, et cetera, this is completely trivial, what I'm saying, right? <laughs> they, they, of course, know it all along. But uh, for me, who comes from a camera lens-based paradigm, it's a, it's a massive shift to enter a paradigm that's fundamentally different from photography or even video, which is an electronic paradigm. Um, we have now staunchly as or we are about to enter a thermodynamical paradigm of image creation which is not linked anymore with you know ideas of re reflection refraction etc but more linked to questions of energy expenditure of heat diffusion of financial technologies trying to minimize risk so if then people are basically getting trained to enter this thermodynamical paradigm of image making and norm normalize you know, all the underlying political economy that's behind, how then to untrain yourself uh, from being trained by basically machine learning mechanisms. And I think that one of the most remarkable thing about these technologies uh, specifically image generation is not even anything, uh, any of the topics I talked about now, but their apparent capacity to spawn a whole, you know, new level of protests, which could be called recursive protests against this kind of image making paradigm. And I think that this is where those technologies have their biggest social impact until now in catalyzing actual protest, but also organize counteraction on many levels. 
I would just like to go through a couple of you know counteractions. This is a very well known one. Uh, in the beginning, when Dell E and other generators came out, there was of course um, there was concerted actions by certain image platforms to oppose being harvested for imagery and data by putting up those banners, um, which led to a position which I understand, but do not fully share, that basically individual creators of IP intellectual property need to be individually recompensated uh, for the theft and expropriation of their data by machine learning companies. But I think that the really interesting thing about these image generators is that basically any, any rendering produced through these generators is commonly and collaboratively produced, meaning that there's always hundreds, if not thousands of people who are, um, who are contributing one way or another to produce this rendering, be it as you know, creator of the original data, person that programmed the model, the ghost worker, the annotator, the person that cleaned the data, the person that made the infrastructure, created the machinery, um, led the cables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like basically building the pyramids. Every Every single of these renderings has a lot of co-creators. And it would be an interesting um, way to start thinking through collaboratively, also be re recognizing, first of all, the collective authorship, and secondly, finding ways to also redistribute the benefits, if there are any, of this kind of image creations towards all the authors and contributors to this imagery. Uh, I think this would make more sense than to suggest individual opt-in or opt-out buttons to be or not to be included uh, into certain training data sets. So, because any product that relates to machine learning is a product of cooperation between many, many people. As I said, any of these products is by definition produced in common, but then privatized. The authorship is assigned to, and also the property and the ownership is assigned to only one person. So there's actually, more and more solutions to this dilemma. And uh, this is almost towards the end to the talk. I will go through them one by one. I think there's by now five or maybe six, I lost count, ways to oppose this kind of situation. Um, as I already said, the, the first one I've already hinted at, it's the cooperative model. It's unfortunately also the most complicated model, which would be to redefine both the data collections of the training data, as well as the models which are trained on them as data commons that acknowledge the collaboration of all the actors involved. A data commons is something in which a community collectively governs the use of the resource through collective participation. And in fact, you know, you don't need to reinvent those models. They already exist. I have a member of a very old school artist rights society, which is already pursuing this kind of model in relation to social media, for example. They argue that they represent artist rights by default regardless whether artists have individually agreed to this or not, the proceeds are then redistributed among the members of this artist rights society. So you don't even need a lot of digital technology to do this. These solutions in a way already exist. But as I said, they are cumbersome, they are complicated, they require a lot of additional bureaucracy and also royalty distribution uh, didn't work very well for NFTs, to be honest, or to models like Spotify. 
so maybe there is a much easier method. There is, of course, there is a very old method tried and tested since the Neolithic, which is called taxation. It has been working very well since agriculture was scaled. And I think it's only fair for society to reclaim what machine learning companies cost them in terms of providing a free sandbox for unpaid testing, free data provision, and also large scale social experimentation. I think that these are services that big, um, big digital oligopolies should pay for in, in form of taxation. And the second one is, of course, regulation. And this is what Kenyan authorities employed when they shut down the World Point data grab a few weeks ago. Um, it turned out that the Kenyan authorities had already ordered WorldCoin to just seize this uh, along, uh, some weeks ago, but uh, WorldCoin seems to have just ignored it. So basically, Kenyan authorities seized the service, seized the machines, shut down the operation, and made clear that it's absolutely possible to stop some parts of data grabs if there is something that wants to, if, if there is someone, a state actor, for example, that wants to really do it. There is one option which I like also uh, very much, um, which I call the waffle exit. What is this? This is um, a photo which I took when WorldCoin came to Berlin and uh, started proposing its scheme uh, to local people in a shopping mall. So they put up their orbs and tried to recruit people for scanning. And I watched this for a whole afternoon. It turned out they couldn't convince a single person to have it done, even though they really racially profiled people. Um, they were looking for basically young male persons with a phone in their hands, preferably from minority backgrounds, um, to sell their work, work coins to them, but no one was really interested. The reason was that there was another promotion action right next to it, which was giving out free waffles um, for a radio station. And everyone preferred the free waffles to the world coin. And I think it's also a very good option to decide that actually you prefer not to enter this sort of onboarding scheme and that uh, you prefer waffles to world coin, so to speak. The next solution would be poisoning, which is a sort of technological um, possibility that researchers of the University of Chicago have proposed in a paper um, published, I think, two weeks ago or 10 days ago, very recently, which is basically to sort of mask your own images, your own videos, whatever. Uh, anything that could be exploited and appropriated as training data to sort of put them through a masking process to confuse the recognition and uh, basically um, tagging um, um, capabilities of models. So basically that models would start to get confused or you know be put closer to model collapse because you modified your own data so as to confuse the models. And now there is, of course, a whole other strand of activities to be done to entrain yourself from being trained by uh, AI, which is the area of strikes. Um, this is a strike, uh, a photo from the recent strike actions of the WGA, um, which was on strike for quite a long time. Um, to, among many other things, uh, negotiate for the for against the appropriation of data by AI and also the let's say un, um, 
and non-agreed use of machine learning technology and script writing processes and so on and so on. And this is, of course, not the first strike against these um, forms of expropriation. There was the unionization of the Kenyan data workers, of the Kenyan so-called micro-workers, um, even prior to this who started to oppose their exploitation through, you know, annotation companies. And I think that this kind of protest or strike is um, where the next steps could be, in my opinion. Uh, for example, organizing so-called data unions, as suggested by Jaron Lenya, or even expanding the good old-fashioned model of the artist right union, which I already talked about. Because, and now I'm really at the end of my talk, there is no automatic progress to get to this point. Uh, if people will know, not actively fight to share the benefits of technology, if there are any, which is doubtful, I guess, in this, um, in this area, if they will not actively fight to share benefits and other cooperative endeavors, it will just not happen. This is what a person called Dar Darren Ajemol emphasizes in a recent book, which is called Power and Progress, where he basically writes a history of technological progress since the Neolithic. And he analyzes that basically the benefits of productivity gains were never shared voluntarily by the people that had proclaimed themselves the owners of you know, the, the benefits. So this means that one could, um, there is now a whole range of procedures to try to untrain oneself from being, let's say, forcefully adapted and aligned with machine learning technologies, which is a combination of regulation, taxation, bottom-up organizations such as unions, plus a civil society drive to rewrite this narrative of automatic progress. And they all have to come together to bust those monopolies and to try to redirect the technological benefits, if there are any, to all people involved with them. Now, as the very last thing, I want to show you something which I even haven't, which I'm going to add now. Sorry, <laughs> I said it's going to be a little improvised. This is also uh, a photo, a documentation of a protest that happened at MoMA, maybe six weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. And it is um, happening in front of a huge energy guzzling LED screen on which a work by Efik Anadol, machine learning based work is playing and it is a climate protest. You see people who have who are lying down on the floor here to stage a die in to protest the involvement of the Museum of Modern Art or some of its board members with pipeline projects. And as I said, the um, capacity of machine learning technologies to spawn surprising protests everywhere in all areas of society is for me the most important takeaway and what I've learned from the story so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hito, for that fantastic um, introduction to um, the series. And um, I really enjoyed returning to think through uh, Jonathan Bella's work in relation to what you've been speaking about. Um, I We have a QA and a um, panel that should be open where you can start thinking through what kinds of questions you'd like to um, ask Hito. So please um, add that, add your questions now and we will present them to her. Um, and I uh, also wanted to mention, as I mentioned in my opening chat, uh, op opening intro, that you'll have the opportunity to ask her um, in 
in person those questions. And if if you don't want the opportunity to switch on your camera and ask them, please let us know. Now, I notice that the questions are not exactly forthcoming. Everyone's digesting it. So maybe I could be permitted to ask you the first question, Hito. Um, so wonderful that we ended with uh, Refik Anadol's work at SFMOMA. Um, you were talking a lot about um, ways in which uh, people can think through um, acts of resistance or, or ways of working with these technologies. And um, we're currently in an environment where public cultural institutions have been um, a subject to forms of new managerialism, new forms of analytics, reporting, um, uh, reduced public funding, and AI spectacle seems to be a way to ride the AI hype and bring in uh, audiences to the institution where they will increase footfall, um, spend more in the gift shop, and also give the art institution an air of um, contemporary relevance. And I'm wondering, um, my question is, what do you think might be a kind of progressive praxis for those workers in cultural institutions and in in this context? And do you think there is the possibility that um, much as we've seen Google workers uh, protest against um, working on things like Project Maven and uh, tech workers sort of beginning to critique their role in this um, onboarding and, you know, spectacle, do you think that is a possibility in art institutions and, and how should those working in institutions think through um, the entry of these technologies from AI imaging prizes to other forms of um, programming that we're seeing into the art institution? Oh, yeah. Right now, there are so many things going on. I don't really know where to start answering these questions, honestly. But I mean, let's just wind back six months or, or more a year when we had the huge NFT hype and many museums were trying to jump on that train <laughs> before it also crashed spectacularly. And it was very clear, um, the strategy was very clear. The big museums, especially in the US, UK, West kind of world are trying to access the coveted tech money, <laughs> which never was very interested in sponsoring their activities. So that was basically the strategy. And I think it's same with the so-called AI spectacles. It's less to it's less aimed towards the public, but towards onboarding potent sponsors from the tech industry. Um, there's a lot of precedent. For many years, there were basically artists on the payroll of big tech companies basically acting as almost artistic ambassadors, etc., who had access to, you know, big quantities of compute, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yes, yeah, so basically this field is blurring. It's a bit like this sneakers, you know, where um, fashion industry and um, edition businesses are sort of merging soon happens now in the, in the tech field. Now, for what workers in institutions should do, I don't know. I don't work uh, in an art institution. But I doubt this is on anyone's mind right now. Mm. Thanks. Um, and I think many of the questions that you raise um, are going to ripple through next week's um, discussion on the future of the commons, the data commons, um, and the kind of way in which if we think about institutions, they were encouraged to scan everything, do this great digitization project, scan their collections for democratizing access. And now how do we think through um, this kind of act and its relationship to the public realm? And um, how might they think through those sorts of questions um, as there is a kind of crisis, both of the creative commons, but this idea of open. So 
it's been fantastic to hear you speak a bit more about that, those kinds of questions in your talk. Now, Hito, we have um, one question from Andre in the audience. Andre, would you like to unmute and turn on your video and ask your question to Hito? Hi. Ah, great. Uh, Thanks. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it's rather a comment or uh, an interest in your opinion on uh, the proposed solutions like poisoning of data or uh, forming unions pushing against uh, these AI companies stealing the data or harvesting data will ultimately lead, in my opinion, to forming closed groups on Discord, Fora, Telegram, Signal. And that will actually break the internet as we knew from 70s, 80s, 90s, from last millennium, which was the utopia of, of open sharing of data, mostly between university scientists. So the scientists at Western universities, they will have no issue on asking about these large data sets. But <clears throat> isn't it that these proposed solutions will ultimately lead to closed internet in private groups? I, I think that's already happening, right? That's already happening large scale, not only on a, let's say, personal level that people retreat into, you know, even Telegram or Signal or, you know, just basically um, other messenger apps or Discord, um, but also on a larger geopolitical level, right? There is no one internet. There is kind of many closed cybers of different internets going on. So in that sense, it's mirroring the fragmentation that started a long time ago already. And I think that ultimately the industry will find ways to avoid this wholesale loot and to shift into something marginally more uh, palatable, right? Is to create, you know, like um, Getty images is doing create schemes of redistribution for people contributing to large data sets whereby people get absolute pittance for their IP. I think that's definitely going to happen, but the fragmentation of the internet is in full swing. It's already largely achieved. Thank so you. could you summarize the guiding principles, the first axioms of, uh, I miss that a little because due to the extent, it's a really complex topic. So for internet, like the first axiom was open sharing of data accessibility to everyone, but now it's changed to, I don't even know where to be begin. It's so... I'm interested in what you have to say. Well, it's changed to more bigger and smaller bubbles and echo chambers, um, you know, of different sizes for, for many different reasons. But the premise of not sharing the data for these companies to harvest, was it yeah. because of the, like, survival of these writers striking against their improper use of data? Is it the, uh, like, peop artists would be afraid about losing their uh, livelihood? I think or some are afraid of losing their livelihood. And companies did harvest the data because they could get away with it. And so now no one really objected. Now people start objecting. But Personally, I think it's an opportunity not to start um, claiming your own personal IP, but to reflect what it means to basically share um, ownership, but also stewardship of data 
in a in a in a in a larger common, which is not going to be the whole internet. I'm afraid, and I think that never was the case, but um, it's definitely not the case right now. Andre, you should bring these questions to next week's panel where um, we'll have someone from the Open Future Foundation talk about many of those kinds of pressing issues for those who had, you know, been part of the open movement and how they're thinking through these questions now. Um, I have a question from my colleague Chaitanya, um, who, uh, which I'll read out. Artists and academics do have a track record of getting co-opted, as we can regularly see in the higher education and museum gallery industries. This might hold true whether we're looking at pyramids, as you said, or machine learning. Are we essentially looking at a new level of entanglement in an existing historical paradigm, or do you think this is a completely different phenomenon? Probably both, no. I think definitely there is a new level or a new pattern of image production, which is more a pyramid scheme of what it used to be, because you know, to make a photograph doesn't require that huge amount of infrastructure. I mean it requires one, but a slightly different one. But now if you run any stream through these image generators, you're already basically part of the pyramid one way or another. Um, so it's a new paradigm, but probably the ways of production <laughs> just keep <laughs> persisting and need to be re-disentangled and will probably manifest again. Yeah. It's a never-ending process, I'm afraid. Thanks, Chaitanya, for that question. Um, we've got one from Rachel Faulkner here who um, has asked me to ask you, how might images themselves those co those authored or co-authored by artists and collectives start to reflect their engagement with the new paradigm of thermodynamic energy mm -hmm. from a tactical point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an amazing question. I wish you, the person who put it, could answer it a bit. That's that's exactly the question, right? I think there is a way. Uh, or there are multiple ways for doing it. You know, reflecting on the entanglement with all things related to the climate, to sharing of property and ownership, uh, to financial um, technologies, but also imaginaries. You know, there, there's a lot of possibilities to try to formulate ways for the images themselves to critically engage with it. Um, and I, I, have, I, I have a few ideas myself, but I need to develop them first. This segues well your answer into the next question, which is what might these wild developments mean in the short term for your own artistic practice? Are you making work on this or avoiding this other than in the academic context? Yeah, uh, both. Um, I'm right now really trying to observe and to just figure out what's happening on the one hand, or which also is, of course, going inside the mechanism and trying to test it and try to see what it's able to do or not, but not publishing any of that. Um, but if I find a way to, to work with it, which I consider mm, okay, then I might do it. I don't know. I haven't found one. Um, I mean, definitely, you know, exploring. And I think this is also well possible without using these tools at all exploring the political economy of this whole industry is definitely worth, worthwhile and probably it doesn't need you know to really use the image generators it's not necessary to do this on that note hito i noticed that people working in the ai ethics field um are kind of hopeful that yes. these tools might be used 
in progressive ways for a kind of countervisuality. And yes, and I just wondered what whether you think um, outputs of uh, image synthesis have the capacity to be um, work as counter images uh, or revolutionary images for change. I'm, I'm not complete. I'm not excluding this. I'm just mm -hmm. not very optimistic right now. Mm -hmm. I think there also will be a, a very fast um, development in the field itself in terms of coming up with smaller models, which do not rely that much on this, you know, massive um, exploitative infrastructure. It's very hard to say right now, but definitely what I can say for now is just to basically cosmetically getting rid of the most blatant aspects of bias while leaving the whole infrastructure intact is not gonna cut it. Thanks, Hito. And we've got um, a further question from Polina, who says, you mentioned artists on payroll at tech companies in one of your previous answers. Could you say a little bit more about their involvement and position within these companies? Well, I mean, big tech companies started basically um, giving out large grants or residencies, giving out re residencies to certain artists quite a while ago, I think as far back as 2016, 2017. So that's been going on for a while. Um, yeah, I mean, it's nothing new. Big car companies also give big commissions to artists, right? So basically the same also happened uh, in the tech industry, which also may or may not have been connected to an attempt to basically create a parallel art world, art industry, uh, which was realized with NFTs, where that could be implemented very quickly, top down. Um, which also, you know, mm, creates a sort of very unequal playing field between those artists who reduce those sponsorships outright and lose access to basically new technology, very new technologies, uh, large amounts of compute and so on. Ito, we have um, a question from a museum director in Australia, Seb Chan. Seb, would you like to um, ask Hito the question? Are you there, Seb? Are you able to unmute or have we muted you? Oh, mic is off. Okay. Can you unmute, Erica? Oh, he's in a noisy environment, he says. Okay. So... Um, this is another one relating to institutions uh, where he says the complexity and opacity and generally low technical literacies of the broader public, not to mention being time poor, often make the work that artists do to critique and raise concerns about these technologies easily opaque, equally opaque. Um, how can we, uh, what role could our institutions play in addressing this? Um, I guess also this question of a visual literacy, right? Like um, yeah. we're still looking at images and slowing them down as though it somehow some essence or truth will be revealed. But really what you're saying is we need to be thinking about the back end. We need to be thinking about the whole ecosystem. And that's, you know, that's something for in, hard for institutions to do. Um, also working to educate uh, people on, on the hype, right? I think that right now many institutions are multiplying the hype that is uh, providing free PR for big tech corporations to promote their products to increase the use of chat GPT, etc. And I think that public institutions do have a role in trying to educate the public even in the fundamentals of how these things work, how they are constituted, etc. And yes, I agree that um, <laughs> artworks about these technologies are equally opaque. We will try our best. 
to improve our artworks to make them more accessible, but things are happening very fast. Great. I take on board. We've got a great follow up question around, you know, the art school also as a site for onboarding. Um, and, you know, can the art school ensure new generations of students' engagement with these tools is critical and ethical, or is that oh, possible? Oh, yes, definitely it can. I'm in, the, I'm in that position, actually. It's much easier for me to talk to that than to an art museum, which I'm not part of. But I'm a teacher at a university, and I just recently... Uh, transferred to another university to build a class for very new media, including generative um, in images, imagery, generative image production, which means basically AI. And I'm very determined to do this in a critical sense, um, but this also requires, among many other things, that people in art schools, meaning students, but everyone actually, will have to at least acquire basic literacy and coding, et cetera, to even start to attempt to work with the tools themselves and modify them. So it will require a much more in-depth you know, training than we used to have at many art schools. And I'm very aware that this is part of the push you know, in, in my um, example by the states to, it's basically an onboarding um, push to throw amounts of money into the education system to create some kind of literacy or ability of people to deal with this kind of tools. But I think that at least on this end, we can contribute as teachers to provide critical tools and also practical abilities to basically uh, undo the hype. Peter, do you have time for two more questions? Yes, uh, oh, it's 10, 15, yeah. Okay, I, I will try to be, if you just give me one minute to delay the next. Uh, <laughs> Okay, yeah, I understand. I, we'll just do two more questions. They were just lurking in the chat and I hadn't seen them. Um, so uh, Karen um, said, when will it become critical that we incorporate methods for forgetting or unknowing in our data <laughs> systems, just as humans need to be able to forget mm -hmm. um, as a counterposition to only ever growing knowledge? Yes, uh, absolutely. But, you know, model collapse is already a part of, or it's a structural tool to forget anything but the most likely outcomes. So one must probably ask oneself what to forget. And actually, it's I could get the same answer that one archivist, arch archivist gave me once at the university. I went into the University of Frankfurt, completely naive, um, imagining that a certain document from the 60s would still be stored. And this person told me, you know what, you're completely naive. We archivists, we are not tasked with storing things, with, we are tasked of, to get rid of things. And our task is to, you know, curate um, which things we will get rid of. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's a good answer to this question. Thanks, Hito. We have one final question. Melinda, I see you're there and you couldn't put your hand up. Would you like to ask Hito directly? Okay, but you can't unmute. Oh, you're unmuted, great, thanks. I've unmuted, fantastic, thank you. Um, hi, uh, thanks for that talk. I was really fascinated and just following on from um, info on model collapse. I'm a little bit fascinated by the idea of poisoning the model. And, you know, I've grown up on movies like there's an Australian movie called um, $3 where a guy poisons 
a bank's predictive finance system to actually lose all the bank's money uh, where they think they're going to gain and things like Mr. Robot, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm just wondering, you talked about artists masking mm -hmm. their data so that it can't be fed or it disrupts the model. But what about the idea of like actually inventing poison to feed into the model, into the large language models? Was it? Yeah, basically this is a way to actually poisoning them. Um, I mean, apart from the fact that they are already poisoning themselves by feeding yeah. basically on their own pieces, but there is a way to also actively poison them without on the surface compromising your own data is to basically subtly, imperceptibly change the pixels to um, confuse the image recognition capabilities of this model. I can share these papers by the scientists of the University of Chicago, which give a detailed uh, description of this procedure. But poisoning is happening for good and bad. And I also have to add, as you know, enchanted I am by this possibility, it also adds to the almost wholesale distrust of any sort of recording, be it image or sound right now, uh, meaning that any sort of photographic or um, audio evidence is continuing to lose any sort of purchase because we also know there is poisoning processes around and before that much more simple um, pro um, possibilities you know, to fake content. So this is basically the flip side of these subversive processes is the complete lack loss of trust into any image or sound. Yeah, that's sort of, yeah. Doing a colonial act on the colonizing AI. It's interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Melinda, for that question. Um, Hito, I'm mindful you need to go. So thank you. Um, very much to everyone for your attention and your questions. I wonder if everyone would like to unmute and just like clap so Hito can sense your presence if um, the moderator would allow it. There you go.